evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm uh, Stephen Aaron, and I'm the chair of the history department at UCLA. And I am delighted to welcome everyone to this year's Aldenburg Lecture. The Aldenburg Lecture honors two longtime friends of the history department, Jerry Alden, who unfortunately can't be with us this evening, and Barbara Berg, who is with us right here uh, in front of me. Uh, Barbara and Jerry's direction uh, for many years of the Friends of History group brought vital support to graduate students uh, in our department. And they also, for years and years, opened up their homes for stimulating salons that brought our faculty out of the classroom and into the public realm. You can find more complete biographies of uh, Jerry and Barbara in your program. Indeed, um, I'm not going to do extended introductions of any of the participants in our program this evening because we have it here. And one of the things I learned in my uh, travel about history and the pub pub bringing history into the public realm was unlike in academia, where it's customary to spend the first 20 or 25 minutes introducing the people who are going to speak. Uh, in other worlds where time perhaps is at a greater premium, uh, it's possible actually to simply refer people to the programs that you are all handed and trust that uh, you can read their uh, impressive biographies for yourself. Um, in the, uh, as I say, but I do want to say before we get to uh, this evening's program, um, I hope you'll join me in thanking Jerry Alden and Barbara Berg. Please stand, Barbara. <laughs> for their leadership of the Friends of History, and more broadly for their insistence that for history to matter, historians must move beyond the comfortable realm of the academy and put themselves in the public arena. That commitment to making history matter uh, has become a signature of the UCLA History Department over the last several years. It's so fitting then that this year's Aldenburg Lecture, which is actually the fifth Aldenburg Lecture, contributes to the mission uh, of bringing history into the public realm by addressing important issues in the past and connecting these to the present. I should add that the Aldenburg Lecture is one of many ways in which we have sought to fulfill that mission of putting history in public and making the study of the past matter more to more people, especially by unveiling its connections to the present and to the future. Indeed, just yesterday, uh, after our annual luncheon to thank supporters of our graduate students, in, in which our students, our graduate students who have received support, each deliver very brief, and we limited them to 120 seconds, and I'm so pleased that they all stayed within that very tight time limit, um, to deliver very brief summaries of their research. Meyer Luskin suggested that next time, we should challenge the students to offer a sentence or two uh, that distills how and why their projects matter to present day concerns. That's an excellent challenge. We're going to take it up next year when we convene again. Uh, for it seems to me, I, I say, while as historians we're trained to look backward, we also need to prepare our students to look forward. It's no surprise that Meyer Luskin made that suggestion to me because he has consistently challenged everyone at UCLA, and this is by no means unique to the history department, he and Rini Luskin have consistently challenged us to put our knowledge to good, or to put our, I guess the social science campaign slogan is to knowledge for good. Um, for us, that means bringing history into the realm of the public, and more specifically into the realm of public policy, so as to demonstrate for policymakers how a better understanding of the past is vital to developing better policies for the future. To that end, this evening's Aldenburg program presents a look at the past with an eye to the future. The starting point, uh, and, a, and a wonderful starting point, 
is the lecture that John Mac Farragher of Yale University will be offering that explores the frontier origins of Los Angeles. Now it's interesting, because Los Angeles in the 20th century became the capital of the movie industry, and because the Westerns emerged during the 20th, or the, much of the first half of the 20th century, century as the dominant genre produced by Hollywood, that Los Angeles has so often served as a backdrop, uh, as the scenes in which, uh, or the Southern California served as the scenery uh, in which so many Westerns were filmed. And yet, almost none of those Westerns, and Johnny, you can correct me, uh, almost none of those Westerns were actually ever set in Los Angeles. And yet, um, if, if, um, if you wanted a Western that featured ample violence, then as John Mac Farragher's book, Eternity Street, demonstrates, um, Los Angeles in the 19th century offers a scene ripe for a Western. Uh, Eternity Street, however, the book that John McFarger has recently published, Eternity Street blows away any Wild West fantasies that we might, uh, might, we might, we might entertain. His relentless excavation of the archives and his vivid narrative gives us a very dark portrait of the violence and injustice that shaped 19th century Los Angeles. It is a master work by one of our nation's preeminent historians, and I'm pleased to say that after our program this evening, we will have books for sale in the lobby, uh, which Professor Farragher will happily sign for you. Um, I should add that we will also, after the program, have a reception upstairs. But first, buy your book, um, get it signed, and also, I guess, in my role as chair, I can say we have donation cards ready outside. So please feel free to make a contribution to the UCLA History Department while you're out there buying a book. Um, or maybe don't feel so free, do it. Um, in any case, um, what made the book, what made Johnny Farragher's book so exciting, uh, what made me so excited to have him here as the Aldenburg lecturer this year, is that Eternity Street is really a history that very much, I think, resonates in the present. This is history that should and must speak to the ways in which we, to us, as we contemplate the violence and injustice that shapes Los Angeles still. And to help us think about the links between past and present, to help us make the leap from history to policy, we are also this evening very fortunate to have Zev Yaroslavsky and James Newton offering commentary and questions to help stimulate the conversation following Professor Farragher's talk. As their brief bios underscore in your uh, program, Yaroslavsky and Newton are extremely well suited to act as translators, having spent their careers in various ways studying the past and shaping policies uh, in the present. In Zev's case, uh, this has been done principally through his decades of leadership in city and county government, in Jim Newton's case, it has come through the biographies and histories he has written and the reporting and editorial stewardship he provided for so many years at the Los Angeles Times. And I guess to conclude here, I would say, in case you don't read their biographies very carefully, let me cut to the most important part of them. Both Zev Yaroslavsky and James Newton are now part of the UCLA community uh, and have been, I should add, especially vital to the history department's efforts to further the conversation between history and policy. So I'm very grateful to them. So what we will have is Professor John McFarragher will give his talk on Eternity Street, and then we'll convene a conversation with you and with our panelists to think about, more specifically, the ways in which we translate the history that John McFarragher's Eternity Street brings forward with the issues that we must grapple with today. So now I've gone way over that three-minute limit that I imposed on everyone else, uh, and I'm delighted to welcome Professor John McFarragher. Thank you very much, Steve. It's my pleasure to be here this evening. And uh, 
As a great historian once said, the only thing that, diff that changes about the past is the questions that we ask about it. Our questions are always questions that come from the present. And uh, that's certainly true of my foray into the frontier history of Los Angeles. Now, my subject today is the history of violence and justice in Los Angeles in the years before Southern California was linked to the rest of the continent by rail connections in 1876. Although Los Angeles was founded in 1781, it was not until more than a century later with the real estate boom of the 1880s that the city began to appear on the national radar. The preceding period, which I write about in my book, Eternity Street, is terra incognita for most Americans. I would guess probably for most Angelinos. Well, let me... What we have here on the screen is uh, one of the first, and I think it is, the first published image of Los Angeles from a US government publication of 1856. The past, as they say, is another country. Frontier Los Angeles, the country I've spent the past 10 years exploring, was a place both foreign and uncomfortably familiar. Violence is a commanding subject in our history, as American as cherry pie, in the famous phrase of black nationalist H. Rep. Brown. The violence of colonial invasion and ethnic cleansing, of enslavement and forced labor, of massacre and riot. These forms of collective violence have often claimed the attention of historians and all are important to the history of Los Angeles. Less well studied is personal violence, the violence of the household and the street. Yet the toll of personal violence has almost certainly been greater than all the collective violence of our past. As New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristof recently noted, more Americans have died from guns in the United States since 1968 than in all the battlefields of all the wars in American history. Personal violence was even more significant for 19th century Americans than it is for us. Yet few historians have examined it and compared it with other times. And that's largely because the evidence is problematic. Civil authorities defined violent crimes, such as assault and battery and rape, inconsistently and reported them irregularly. Domestic violence offers an, a striking example of this, since in many times and places it was not defined as a crime at all. Homicide, on the other hand, offers the best way to track the violence of a society. Murder is a more reliable measure because dead bodies were impossible to ignore or define away. Moreover, criminologists have demonstrated a strong positive correlation between a society's rate of homicide, the ratio of deaths to the size of the population, and the frequency of other less lethal forms of violence. In other words, the more murder, the more assault and rape. The homicide rate may be seen indeed as an index to the generalized violence of a society. Now in recent years, the, his the historical study of homicide has taken off among historians. Perhaps the most notable discovery is the long-term decline in the frequency of lethal violence whoops, in European societies for very high rates. So here, this, this here on this side we have uh, the homicide rate, the number of homicides per 100,000 population, and note that it's an, a logarithmic scale. So we have 1, 10, 100. These are in orders of magnitude. So if we were doing it actually a linear, linear scale, it would be through the roof. And then the historical study of various societies and where they, they meet on this scale, and then along the bottom, a time uh, dimension. And so as, as, what we see here is that this dramatic decline in violence over the course of uh, a half a millennium. From very high levels in medieval times, over the course of several centuries, the rate dropped by two orders of magnitude. 
The pace and size of that decline, as you can see, varied in different countries, but by the 20th century throughout Western Europe, the rate of homicide had fallen to about one violent death for every 100,000 uh, people. And that's the way statisticians uh, compute the homicide rate, the number of homicides per 100,000 population. The most compelling explanation for this decline focuses on the, emergency, the emergence of, um, of a monopoly of violence by nation, nation states, on the development of state-sanctioned systems of justice, and on a corresponding civilizing process, the pacification of personal comportment that first occurred among elites and then spread down to ordinary people. North America also experienced this kind of a falling rate. And I've tracked the United States on this same chart here uh, with the information that we have about the United States now. Uh, but by contrast with Western Europe, the, the trend downward stalled in the United States, resulting in a striking gap in contemporary homicide rates, actually through the whole 20th century. Throughout that century and into the first decade of this one, the United States reported the highest frequency of lethal violence of any of the world's economically advanced democracies. Even after the significant decline in the homicide rate in the United States over the past quarter century, a drop of 50% or more, the current national rate of 4.5 violent deaths per 100,000 is more than three times the rate in Canada. But the United States is a big country with a great deal of regional variation. And since at least the late 19th century, when civil authorities first began to collect and publish vital statistics, virtually all the states with homicide rates higher than the national average have been located in the nation's south and west. So here, uh, the three periods, 1890, 1930 to 45, and 1995, I've listed all the states with homicide rates higher than the national mean. So in this instance, the national mean is calculated as 100, and so all the states higher than that rate are listed on the chart. All the states uh, in blue are western, the states in red are southern. And with the two exceptions that are highlighted in the last column, every state on this list is from the south or the West. Now, among the states with homicide rates lower than the national average, by induction, uh, they were in the North, closer to Canada, and their rates were closer to Canada's. While in the states of the South and West, the pattern was closer to Mexico's. Los Angeles was settled by migrants from Mexico, and the American South. So Los Angeles is very much a part of the history of violent America. Now the foundation of my history of frontier Los Angeles is an enumeration of all the homicides recorded in historical sources between 1830, when Cal California was under Mexican jurisdiction, and 1875, the 30th year of American rule. Searching surviving Los Angeles County court records, newspapers, and other primary documents over that period, I was able to document a total of 468 homicides. And here is just, it's a, this is a screenshot of a single page of that database that I compiled about, um, of, of all the homicides in Los Angeles between those dates. I've now uploaded this uh, database to the website of the Criminal Justice Research Center at Ohio State University. It's available for anyone to examine and use uh, to, uh, for their own study. 468 murders is a lot of violent death for such a small frontier outpost, the home of fewer than 2,000 residents in 1830 and no more than 20,000 in the county in 1875. But to really compare LA's lethal record with other places, we need to compute the frequency of violent death. We need the homicide rate. And I can give that to you. So this is just simply a, a rate that's computed knowing the number of homicides and knowing the size of the population. During the Mexican period, from 1830 
from 1830 to 1849, including the interregnum of American military occupation from 1847 to 1850, uh, during which Mexican institutions continued to operate, the average annual homicide rate was 113. Remember what I said before, the rate today is nationally 4.5. By comparison, consider that St. Louis, which in 2014 held the dubious distinction of being the most violent city in the United States, the reported homicide rate was 50. Now, a rate of around 100 is what historians have found in, most, in the most violent regions of medieval Europe. What is it like to live in a place with a homicide rate of 113? As Harvard social psychologist Steven Pinker puts it, the violence would begin to affect you personally, assuming you have 100 relatives, friends, and close acquaintances, then over the course of a decade, one of them would probably be killed. So Mexican Los Angeles had a very high rate of deadly violence, but the worst was yet to come. During the 15 years following the American conquest, the average annual homicide rate in Los Angeles nearly doubled to a whopping 209. With a rate that high, virtually every resident was touched by lethal violence, either directly as a victim, a perpetrator, or a bystander, or indirectly through the shared experience of family members and close friends. Historians have calculated the homicide rate for a variety of 19th century places, and I have yet to see any that are higher than this. Simply put, Frontier Los Angeles was one of the most violent places on the North American continent. Los Angeles is a terrible place for murders, declared the Daily Alta California, a newspaper in San Francisco. Scarcely a steamer arrives that does not bring an account of one or two. Observers were struck by the contrast between Los Angeles's idyllic setting and the terrible things that went on here. The trope of sunshine noir, one of the most persistent images of Los Angeles in the 20th century, emerged very early in the 19th century. There is no brighter sun, no milder clime, no more equable temperature, no scenes more picturesque, no greener valleys, no fairer places, no fairer plains in the wide world than those we may look upon here, wrote John A. Lewis editor of the Los Angeles Star in 1853. And yet, with all our natural beauties and advantages, there is no country where human life is so, of so little account. Men hack one another to pieces with pistols and other cutlery as if God's image were of no more worth than the life of one or two of, uh, than one or two of the three, two or three thousand ownerless dogs that prowl about our streets and make night hideous. And here is that editorial in the star. I've highlighted that phrase. And what a phrase it is, pistols and other cutlery. Well, those 19th century editors knew how to write a line. It's <laughs> Firearms, relatively rare in Los Angeles before the American conquest, were the means of death in only five, one in five cases during the Mexican period. By the time editor Lewis published this lament in 1853, Los Angeles, however, was well stocked with firearms of all sorts, brought in by soldiers and immigrants, or imported for sale by merchants. Firearms quickly became the lethal weapon of choice, accounting for two of every five homicides in the 1850s, three of every five during the 1860s, which is about the same percentage that it is today. Firearms alone were responsible for much of the increase in the homicide rate during the American period. Now, what accounts for such a level of violence? Well, first consider what might be called the structure of violence. Los Angeles was fashioned not once, but twice by conquest and military occupation. Initially conceived in an assault of native homelands by Spaniards marching under the banner of heaven, and then torn asunder once again by Anglo-Americans pursuing their manifest destiny to overspread the continent. The conquering Spaniards 
imposed a system of forced labor on indigenous people, a system that relied on violence to discipline workers and increase the level of production on missions and ranchos. That system remained in place following the secularization or privatization of the missions and the emancipation of the mission Indians. And it continued after the American conquest. But Anglos also arrogantly trumpeted their superiority over Californios, treating them with prejudice, alienating much of the Spanish-speaking population, a majority well into the 1870s, and creating the conditions for generations of continuing conflict. Moreover, ineffective law enforcement and feeble institutions of justice on the periphery of the nation state, whether that was the Republic of Mexico or the United States of America, meant that disputes between men in Los Angeles were often settled privately, resulting in ongoing feuds and vendettas. This photograph of a Los Angeles family dates from about 1870. Now, these structures of violence reinforced and perpetuated a culture of violence, which offers a second explanation for the high rate of homicide. In the absence of state authority, social order was more often a function of honor than of law. And honor frequently amounted to little more than a man's ability to dominate another man. For Latinos and Anglos alike, the bedrock of honor culture was a man's control of his own household. In the public world, he might be subject to the will of more powerful men, but at home, he alone was dominant, a position he might well enforce through violence. Domestic violence, in turn, was the key to the reproduction of violence. A home could be a refuge from the world, but it could also be a hothouse of rage and tumult, an incubator of the virus of violent behavior that then infected the public world. In histories of violence, the phenomena of domestic violence is too often neglected. It's difficult for historians to get into the closed space of the household. And here, uh, the first published uh, bird's eye views of Los Angeles, the first bird's eye view of Los Angeles, 1857. So we're, the, our view here is about from First Street, looking north, uh, the Plaza Church, the plaza's right here. You see the Elysian Hills, Elysian Park, and then the St. Gabriel's, Mount Baldy, in the, in the background. And we can actually go in here for a closer look. We can't get actually into the household, but we can see the courtyards here. Um, there's an abundance of evidence of domestic violence in all the surviving judicial records of both the American and the Mexican periods, including the stories of hundreds of women victimized by male violence. I'll tell just two stories here. Consider the case of Francisca Maria Perez de Silvas, the first woman to file for divorce in Los Angeles County. Donna Francisca was born into the minor California gentry. Her father owned Rancho Paso de Bartolo, on the east bank of the San Gabriel River. Her husband, an ordinary vaquero named Mariano Silvas, was something of a local hero in the California community, celebrated for his fearless conduct at the Battle of San Pasqual, where he and his fellow lanceros mauled a battalion of US dragoons in 1846, the worst American defeat in the conquest of California. But Silvas was also a notorious wife beater. In 1844, two years before the war, Silvas was summoned by the alcalde to answer his wife's charge of assault and battery. An official sent to the couple's adobe to investigate found Dona Francisca in bed, vomiting blood with bu bruises to her head and shoulders and her ear nearly torn off. She and Silvas had been arguing over the disposition of her share of her father's estate, she said, when he began to pummel her. He dealt me three blows, pulled me out of bed, and dragged me by my hair, leaving me on the floor bathed in blood. It was not the first time, she said, he had beaten her, and she wanted the full weight of the law brought down upon him. Silvas admitted striking his wife. He had been infuriated by her disrespectful tone, he said. 
The alcalde promised to investigate further, but before he could do so, Doña Francisca withdrew her complaint, saying that she and her husband had reconciled. He has expressed regret, she said, and he promises me a new life. Well, Silvas did not keep his promise, and in 1851, four years after the American conquest and a year following the creation of Los Angeles County, Doña Francisca filed for divorce. Silvas represented himself. For the entirety of their 20-year marriage, he testified, his wife had continually tested his patience with her gross and abusive language. Corporal chastisement, he said, was required for domestic peace. Yet it was something he would resort to only when necessary to check her violent and unladylike conduct. The laws of Mexico, Silvas reminded the judge, had allowed no divorce, and it would have been impossible for me to have lived with her without inflicting the chastisement. Such was the custom of the country. The Anglo judge was sympathetic, and he denied Doña Francisca's petition for divorce. The court records from the Mexican and American periods include the voices of scores of women protesting what Silvas called the custom of the country. His perspective was shared by virtually all of the husbands accused of violence by their wives, whether they were Latino or Anglo. Violence figured prominently in two of every five of the 186 divorce cases that came before the district court from 1851 to 1874. Mary Ellen Culberson claimed that William, her husband of 17 years, had beaten her for the whole of their marriage. When his looks and manner were savage and excited, she told the court, I got out of the way as quickly as I could. The last straw came with an incident that left her in fear for her life. Culberson came home drunk, picked a fight, worked himself into a rage, grabbed a loaded shotgun, and pressed the muzzle to his wife's chest. Damn you, I'll kill you, he said, before passing out. The next morning, once he'd sobered up, she asked what he intended by threatening her with a firearm. Just what I said, he responded, you better not let me catch you napping. She left him that same day. Culberson denied his wife's accusations, but he defended his prerogative. She is my wife, he declared to the judge. I can do as I please with her. Intimate and public violence were two phases of the same culture. Malvina Prater filed for divorce from John B. Prater. He threatened to kill me, she alleged, and his treatment was so rough I could not endure it. Prater denied the charge, but several weeks later, just before the final disposition of the case, he assaulted her on a public street. And when a bystander intervened, Prater drew a pistol and fired a shot, which fortunately went wild, injuring no one. Indicted and tried for assault with intent to commit murder, Prater defended himself by claiming he had merely been exercising his right as a husband. An argument Judge Ignacio Sepulveda Yes, that's Sepulveda, Sepulveda Boulevard, rejected out of hand, instructing the jury that a husband had no power to commit a breach of the peace upon the person of his wife any more than upon anyone else, and that bystanders not only had a right but a duty to prevent such a breach of the peace. The jury found Prater guilty, and Sepulveda sentenced him to several years in San Quentin. The court granted Melvina Prater the divorce she desired in his absence. And by the way, it's very rare to find an image like this of people like that. Um, thank goodness for genealogists. I found this one on the website Find a Grave, posted by one of Melvina Prater's descendants. Intimate violence was a problem acknowledged by both Mexican and American authorities, usually with a shrug of the shoulders. What could we do? with the notable exception of Judge Sepulveda, whose ruling came in 1872, very late in my period. The household was the crucial link in the social ecology of violence, the place where violent behavior was modeled and learned and perpetuated and from which it burst into the public world. But it would not be until the late 20th century that it would be taken seriously. Through more stringent policing, through judicial injunction and the assistance and support of battered women. The campaign against domestic violence, which is still, to be sure, a major problem, has been one of the most successful interventions 
of our own time. Here's a photograph of the LA Plaza, the center of the community, the parish church on the left. If those, those of you who know this area will recognize it, although the church looks a little different now. It's been restored to a more authentic look. Um, actually, this is a remodel itself from the original church. Again, the um, Elysian Hills in the background, what were called the Stone Quarry Hills in those days. Uh, where Elysian Park is now, the plaza here. Los Angeles was a violent place. Indeed, during both the Mexican and early American periods, so great was the carnage, the legal justice system simply could not keep up. Violent crime largely went unpunished. So in the absence of formal justice, outlaw justice prevailed. The outlaw justice of vengeance and vendetta and feud the private punishment of disrespect and dishonor, and the popular justice of vigilantism. The first recorded instance of vigilantism took place when Los Angeles was still a Mexican pueblo in 1836. A married woman and her lover had brutally murdered a, her ranchero husband, and although the perpetrators were arrested and jailed, Angelinos had little expectation that justice would result from the drawn out process of the law. A guilty verdict at the local level would automatically generate an appeal to a higher court in Mexico City, which could stretch out the proceeding for months, if not years. A substantial group of several dozen Angelinos, including the representatives of many leading families, met and organized themselves into what they called a junta popular and demanded summary justice. They took no pleasure in superseding the institutions of the Mexican Republic, their leader explained, but their action was necessitated by the frequency of lethal violence in Los Angeles, which threatened a state of anarchy where the might of the strongest is the only law. Although a number of residents opposed the junta, the vigilantes overpowered the authorities, seized the prisoners, and executed them both as several hundred Angelinos watched from the flat-topped roofs of the adobes that surrounded the plaza. Mexican officials condemned the proceeding and arrested the junta's leaders, but they were forced to back down in the face of solid community support for the vigilantes. For the moment, Angelinos were satisfied, but they remained without a legally constituted system that could ensure both order and justice. The high frequency of violence continued until the American invasion in 1846. Outlaw justice simply did not resolve the problem created by the weak institutions of the criminal justice system. The American conquest and occupation during the Mexican-American War introduced yet more turmoil. This is a watercolor painted by a participant, one of the American combatants. Actually, it's a, quite an accurate depiction of the final engagement right outside Los Angeles, the town itself. The commander-in-chief of American forces refused to agree to a ceasefire. He treated California officials with disdain, extending for months a conflict that might have been quickly resolved. With all the attending bitterness that that uh, created. And then with the discovery of gold in the Sierras in 1848, Los Angeles became a way station for thousands of Mexican and American miners headed north. Congressional deadlock in Washington over the issue of slavery in the former Mexican territories delayed until 1850, the formation of state and local government, and the Pueblo descended into what one official described as mob law. This photo looks north across what was then known as Sonora Town, the predominantly Latino portion of the Pueblo north of the plaza. The Anglo criminal justice system that was eventually put in place was Similarly, underfunded, understaffed, and fatally weak. During the 1850s, Los Angeles County suffered an average of 19 homicides a year. Now, just to put that in perspective, the city where I work, where I teach at Yale University, New Haven, Connecticut, last year recorded 19 homicides. That was enough to place New Haven on a list of the nation's 100 most dangerous cities. But New Haven has a population of 130,000. Well, LA County, suffering 19 homicides a year on average in the 1850s, 
counted only five or 6,000 residents. 19 murders a year in a population of 6,000. Do the math, that's a homicide rate of more than 300. That's low level warfare. Yet during the far first five years the that the California District Court operated in Los Angeles, it successfully tried, convicted, and executed only one individual for a capital crime. In the absence of state-sanctioned ju justice, vigilance committees and lynch mobs hanged at least a dozen suspected offenders. Angelino opinion on the question of popular justice was divided, just as it had been during the Mexican period. In 1853, for example, local vigilantes seized a gang of a half dozen Latinos wanted for horse theft and murder in San Luis Obispo County, north. In an impromptu public trial held in a saloon near the plaza, attended by several hundred men, the gang was condemned to death. It soon became apparent, however, that many of the Californios attending the meeting were opposed to a summary ex execution. Manuel Clemente Rojo, a Peruvian who edited the Spanish language pages of the Los Angeles Star, or La Estrella in Spanish, gave a rousing speech attacking the practice of vigilantism. And here is that article. And this also gives you an idea of the kind of sources uh, we historians have to work with here. Try to read that. This, and this is in Spanish, of course. My Spanish is not that good. Significant, this, this speech, the, so the Star was a dual language paper. The, the back of it was in Spanish and the front of it was in English. Interestingly, this article was not printed in the English section. Uh, Rojo's speech was not recorded in the English section, only in the Spanish section. Matters of guilt and innocence, Rojo declared, he was the editor of the section, so he included his own speech. Uh, matters of guilt and innocence, he declared, were the exclusive province of the legally constituted courts, not irregular combinations of vindictive and excited men. The law existed for the good of the whole community, and if Angelinos abandoned the law, the result would be anarchy, he claimed. Several, at that point, several Anglos rushed the stage. Well, he was actually standing on a table in this bar room, and they rushed him, tried to hustle him out of the room. But Rojo held his ground, declaring he refused to be choked off. The existing system of justice in Los Angeles was broken, he acknowledged, but if the sheriff and his deputies were ineffective in enforcing the laws, find new men to take their place. If the courts were ineffective in convicting criminals, place new judges on the bench. If the laws were ineffective, pass new ones that worked. Are we a people who must submit to the immorality, barbarism, and disorder of lynch law, he declared? Are we capable of being shamed into making good use of our freedom? Must we commit injustice when we have recourse to remedy all of our needs? Rojo's questions would haunt Los Angeles for many years to come. In the face of unified California opposition, the gang that night was handed over to the sheriff, who dispatched them north on the next available steamer. It was regular steamer traffic along the coast between San Francisco and Los Angeles. They were met at the San Luis Obispo landing, I think Pismo Beach, by a dozen vigilantes from the area who hustled them to the first available tree and hanged them without ceremony. Soon thereafter, Rojo, who had lived and worked in Los Angeles since 1848, relocated to Ensenada, Mexico where he opened a law practice and spent a life, a long life as a publicly active Mexican citizen. Late in life, years later, asked why he chose to leave Los Angeles, Rojo responded sharply, no me puede aclimatar, I could not acclimate. <laughs> there were others like Rojo who sought to strengthen LA's criminal justice system and end the rule of lynch law, District Court Benjamin Hayes uh, District Court Judge Benjamin Hayes, prominent among them. Here's a photo of Hayes, uh, taken a few months before he set off from Missouri for Gold Rush, California in 1850. A slight man with piercing blue eyes, Hayes had an enormous influence in both his own time and in ours, then because of his championship of the law, now because of his invaluable collection of historical materials which are available for historians and researchers at the Bancroft Library at the University of California, Berkeley. Hayes supported a municipal statute banning the carriage and discharge of firearms within the city limits. But the measure was rejected by the Common Council on the ground that it would require too much policing. 
Hayes then published an anonymous column in the Star arguing for a real police force supported by tax revenue, but that, propo that proposal too was rejected by the council. And I know he wrote these anonymous articles because he clipped them into his scrapbooks, which were at the Bancroft, and wrote on them, I wrote this. <laughs> Pretty good evidence. Hayes responded in yet another anonymous column he was trying to maintain his reputation for impartiality. The city fathers, he argued, had failed to act simply because they feared higher taxes. We hold that life is more important than property, Hayes concluded. Let the council consider the happiness of the many, not yield to the selfishness of the few. Some things always are true. Judge Hayes did what he could to strengthen the district court, but it covered all of Southern California, requiring him to ride the circuit between LA, San Diego, and San, Santa Bar San Bernardino. Nevertheless, in the fall of 1854, formal trials in his Los Angeles courtroom concluded with the conviction for murder of two notorious desperados. Many Angelinos hoped that the public execution of those felons, Felipe Alvitre, a native Californio, and David Brown, an Anglo-Texan, would affirm the supremacy of the law and the legitimacy of the justice system. But only days before the scheduled executions in January 1855, the county sheriff received a stay for the Texan issued by the Chief Justice of the State Supreme Court, but none for the California. Suspending the execution of a condemned Anglo while proceeding with the execution of a condemned Latino fed the worst suspicions of the Spanish-speaking majority. Francisco Ramirez, a brilliant young Californio who had taken over the editing of the Spanish language pages of the Star following Manuel Clemente Rojo's departure from Mexico, argued that the stay should be ignored. Better that people take the law into their own hands, he declared, using lynch law to secure their rights and achieve their goals. Ramirez's boss, editor James Waite, in the center, here's Ramirez, there's Waite, uh, acknowledged that Californios had cause for concern, but he urged the postponement of both executions until the circumstances became clear. He declared he could not condone lynch law. John O. Wheeler, the editor of the rival Southern California, Southern Californian newspaper, and a strong believer in racial justice, argued that the stay was a clear case of prejudice. That there could only be one explanation for the different treatment of the two prisoners, he wrote. One is an American, the other a Californian. He agreed with Ramirez that both men should be hanged, if necessary, by the people themselves. Citizens of Los Angeles, it is for you to say whether this gross and outrageous partiality shall be allowed, Wheeler wrote, whether you will permit so flagrant and glaring an evidence of the omnipotence of birth and condition to operate in widening still further the breach that already exists. A mass meeting of several hundred Angelinos, the majority of them Californios, adopted a resolution demanding that both prisoners be executed at the same time on the same drop, that is, drop through uh, the trap door. A delegation of three men presented the meeting's demand to the county sheriff, who responded that he was determined to follow the, the law and the order of the court. Alvitre would hang, Brown would not. If that happened, the men insisted the people would mount a violent assault on the jail and hang Brown themselves. And that is precisely what happened. After the sheriff and his, and his deputies publicly hanged Alvitre, and it became clear he had no intention of hanging Brown, a large mob made up largely of Californios and led by the mayor of Los Angeles stormed the jail, seized the prisoner, and lynched him from a crossbeam of a gate directly across the street from the sheriff's office. Angelinos had looked for a turning point, and they got one when the Californios of Los Angeles bought into lynch law by hanging David Brown, they literally opened the floodgates. Over the next 15 years, at least 50 individuals were lynched in Los Angeles County. Vigilantism became an institutional fact of LA life, stunting and distorting the development of the legally sanctioned justice system. This image de depicts a mass lynching of late 1863, when the Vigilance Committee broke into the county jail and emerged with the five prisoners in the jail who were charged with capital crimes, 
whom they all, whom they summarily, summarily hanged from the portico of an adobe on the corner of Main and Temple Street. A few weeks later, during the trial of Charles Wilkins, a drifter who confessed to the cold-blooded murder of the brother-in-law of shipping magnate Phineas Banning, Banning and a group of his teamsters stormed Benjamin Hayes' courtroom, overwhelmed the sheriff and his deputies, dragged Wilkins outside and down the street to one of Banning's corrals and hanged the murderer from the crossbeam of the gate. These extra-legal lin extra lynchings did not take place without a great deal of controversy. There were always those who protested popular justice, just as there were those who defended it. Francisco Ramirez, for one, came to regret his previous support for lynch law. He came to the realization that vigilantism offered no guarantee of universal justice, that it arose from the deepest fears of the people and exaggerated their prejudices. The rule of law, Ramirez decided, offered the only sure way forward. Let us work together in a common spirit to enforce the law, he wrote. That's what's required by the times in which we live. His position was ridiculed by supporters of outlaw justice, like Henry Barrows, the town's leading Republican. Ramirez stubbornly opposed vigilantism, wrote Barrows, when he knows, as all know, that justice otherwise will not be done, that no one can be safe in life and property unless the people do rise up. One of the most infamous of the Los Angeles lynchings occurred in 1870, when a murderer named Michel Lacanet was taken from the jail and lynched from the crossbeam of another corral by a large group of vigilantes. The Lacanet lynching would become infamous in local memory for a couple of reasons. First, because it was so systematically and openly organized by the Home Guard Vigilance Committee whose leaders included local businessmen, lawyers, city officials, and even a Methodist minister. And second, because it was the only one of the Los Angeles lynchings documented by a local photographer. So here in William Godfrey's first shot, and William Godfrey ran a place called the Sunbeam Photograph Stu Photographic Studio, and he brought his big box camera out and he set it up. So this is looking at what was known then as Pound Cake Hill. Pound Cake Hill is no longer there, like most of the hills in downtown Los Angeles has been eliminated. But uh, they're looking down on a corral where the mob is just bringing Lacanet up as this shot is taken. He's not yet gotten to the gate. Godfrey then, and notice the people assembling on the hill to watch the spectacle, men, women, and children. It was said that they spread their picnic lunches on a hill and Everyone knew this was going to happen. So Godfrey then repositioned his camera. He must have snapped the shutter sometime, af sometime after Lacanet dropped because you can see the crowd is already dispersing. Many of the men turned toward the camera. Um, Godfrey has probably shouted out, you know, smile for the camera. And you can see them smiling and looking. But it's not them that I'm fascinated with. It's See here in the foreground, all the boys watching the lynching, the reproduction of violence documented for us, their attention fixed on the pathetic scene before them. Finally, the Lacanet lynching would live in infamy because it came to be seen as leading directly to the worst episode of collective violence in the history of frontier Los Angeles. As I argue in my book, Los Angeles developed and was fully ensnared by a lynching culture. Where is all this to end, Editor Lewis had asked in an editorial condemning vigilantism back in 1851. If Angelinos allowed lynch law to continue unchecked, he warned it would inevitably result in the slaughter of innocents and the days of terror will then be upon us. 20 years after his warning in 1871, just months after the lynching of Lacanet, the days of terror arrived. In the late 1860s, the Indians, Californios, Mexicans, and Anglos of Los Angeles were joined by a growing number of Chinese immigrants. Here, Chinatown, a corner in Chinatown, and very near the plaza. 
Um, this photograph's approximately 1875. As the laboring population of Indians declined, largely as a result of epidemic diseases, such as smallpox, they were replaced by Chinese workers. The Chinese were just as violent as other ethnic groups in Los Angeles. And in October 1871, when an Anglo was killed in the crossfire between two warring Chinese gangs, a mob of several hundred Anglos and Latinos, describing themselves as vigilantes, besieged Chinatown, set fire to their residences, and lynched 18 Chinese men on a night of horrific violence on downtown streets. And here, a photograph of the bodies of those victims laid out helter-skelter in the jail yard, uh, in the yard behind the county jail. Ironically, in the two or three years before the Lacanay lynching and the Chinese massacre, the district court had made considerable progress in its ability to render justice. In the years immediately following the Civil War, Los Angeles experienced its first economic boom. Based on the transition from livestock grazing, which had been destroyed by a prolonged drought from 1862 to 65, from livestock grazing to the production of high value crops, crops like walnuts and most famously, of course, oranges. Land division, property sales, new construction projects drove up the number of civil lawsuits overburdening the district court. So this is a chart that ch charts the number of civil lawsuits in Los Angeles County by year. And so here we are in the late 1860s, and then it just takes off. So in response, the state legislature in 1868 carved out a new judicial district to serve Los Angeles alone. And as a consequence, the operations of the court became far more effective and efficient. The change was motivated by the increasing number of civil proceedings, but it had the effect of greatly improving the rate of conviction and clearance of criminal cases. This is an intriguing finding. The justice system was strengthened by the development of the capitalist economy and the corresponding growing power of the state I would in fact argue that the state did not become the leading player in the administration of justice in Los Angeles until this turn. That improved record should have been known by the public, but an accurate summary was never provided by either the authorities or by the local press. And that was a notable failing. For even as the district court tried and convicted more violent felons, editors, as well as the supporters of vigilantism, continued to condemn the legal justice system as ineffective, issuing yet more calls for popular justice. In the aftermath of the Chinese massacre, however, vigilantism was condemned and it lost its favored position. The monstrosity of the thing, wrote one observer of the mob that had massacred the Chinese, was in imitation of the vigilance committee the lawless elements of society have been educated to believe that murder could be indulged in with impunity provided it was committed by a mob instead of a single individual. Indeed, the most dramatic evidence of the improved record of the district court was the trial and conviction of a group of men who had acted as the ringleaders of the mob on the night of the Chinese massacre. And in fact, this page from the court record of the trial of the Chinese rioters um, and this is a, a page from the transcript, oh, including a hand-drawn map of the location of the riot, part of the documentation of better uh, judicial um, effectiveness. And here in another Godfrey photograph, that same location, the location of the Chinese massacre. The improved record of the district court corresponded with a dramatic decline in the frequency of lethal violence. During the 10-year period between 1865 and 1874, the average annual homicide rate fell to 77. Now, you should know by now, 77 is still a very high homicide rate, higher than the most violent American city today, but the lowest level since the American conquest in 1847. Violence in frontier Los Angeles was overdetermined. 
a legacy of colonial conquest, antagonistic relations among ethnic groups, conflicts over land and labor, large numbers of trenchant men, a thriving counterculture of vice and crime, a town overflowing in wine and brandy, deadly weapons readily at hand, a shameful pattern of domestic abuse and violence, all contributed to the mayhem. In the early 1870s, none of these factors had changed appreciably for the better. None of them. Los Angeles continued to be a restless, rowdy rumble of a place, and it would remain so until its transformation into something resembling a middle-class metropolis toward the end of the 19th century. No, what was diff different about Los Angeles in the 1870s was that with the strengthening of the court system, more Angelinos began to believe in the possibility of legal rather than outlaw vi uh, justice. What was true then remains true today. Lacking a conviction that their injury and loss is taken seriously, taken seriously by the police and the courts, communities will take justice into their own hands with violent consequences. And so the cycle continues. Violence happens. People must be made to feel secure that the ordering institutions of their world will work to make things right. That is what we call justice. And justice makes all the difference. Thank you very much. Now, as I said, you know, as, as I said in my introductory remarks, um, one of the comfort zones that we sometimes sit. live in. Stand? No, no. Sit? we have one more. Yeah, one more. We're not going to deny you a seat. You've earned a chair. <laughs> um, one of the comfort zones that we live in as historians at this university is to remain within the academy. <clears throat> um, and as I say, part of the challenge of moving into the public realm is to move out of that comfort zone. The other challenge, I guess, and this was, as I said in my opening remarks, is to think about the link, as you began to develop it in those last sentences, but I think as <coughs> was really implicit in throughout your talk, the link between uh, the past and the present, and to think about making the leap from history to projection and policy. Uh, and I know, look, historians as a group are often quite uncomfortable <laughs> uh, or I should say, I often sort of suggest that we're much better at predicting the past than we are at <laughs> forecasting the future. Uh, and if we were as good at forecasting the future, maybe we'd be that much more important. <laughs> but uh, as that said, I think your talk really and the, and the book uh, really does sort of lend itself to thinking about the ways in which the structures of violence, the cultures of violence, the issues about the strength of the state and the court really do continue to resonate. And I guess I would like to invite first Zev and Jim to sort of reflect on that from their various positions and sort of raise their own set of ideas and questions that will then animate the conversation. Well, first of all, uh, I enjoyed reading the book. Uh, and I highly recommend it because for one thing, leaving aside your basic purpose of writing the book, I learned a lot about my city yeah. and my region and uh, yesterday we were down in uh, UC San Diego. I was driving down and for the first time, I actually understood why there's a street called Pico in, in, in San Diego County, just, just in San Clemente area, uh, because of your descriptions of how, what life was like here in general, uh, how people got around, how long it took, um, names of origi the original names of natural features and all. Um, I'm not gonna pretend to be an expert in uh, in frontier violence, uh, or in violence, but when I was reading, uh, does that include violence at the board of supervisors? No, no, I, that, <laughs> I'm a, that I'm an expert in. <laughs> uh, we had plenty of vigilantes at the board. Of supervisors. Um, but it occurred to me uh, that one of the things, one of the takeaways from your book is kind of your conclusion here at the end: uh, the, the lack of an infrastructure uh, to administer justice, the lack of public confidence such as the public was at the time, small numbers nevertheless, the lack of confidence 
uh, might explain uh, why people took to the streets. And I, I said, I, I thought to myself, and this may be a totally random thing, uh, Jim will appreciate this because he covered it. Uh, when I was on the city council, uh, and one of the few people, one of the few white members of the city council who actually uh, took on the police on force issues, the police department had a, a division called, or a unit called the Special Investigative, it was SIS, I don't remember what the last S was for, but Special Investigative, investigative Section. Yeah, yeah. And, and what it was, uh, was, uh, uh, this is my interpretation, it's not official, uh, I, I, I don't know what the official explanation was by the police department, but they put together this unit uh, to follow people who the police felt they knew had committed violent crimes, murders, armed robberies, bank robberies, and the like. And, and I firmly believe that, that they were, uh, that they believed that was the case. And in most cases, I think that turned out to be the case. But for one reason or another, because of uh, things like the Constitution <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, legal procedure and all, they, they could never nail these people. So they created this SIS unit that would follow these individuals who they knew, or thought they knew, were violent criminals. And essentially taking the law into the police's own hands, if you will, uh, they would follow them for days, weeks, and sometimes months until they committed a crime. And it was usually a violent crime. These weren't petty crimes. They didn't waste these cops on petty crimes. And invariably, after they committed the crime, an armed robbery at a McDonald's, for example, they'd wait for the culprits to come out, get into their car, their getaway car, and then they would follow them and, uh, and then try to trap them, uh, maybe even before they, they took off. And you know, say, police, stop, put your hands up. And invariably, these people would, would uh, turn around and either uh, shoot at the police, which gave them justification to shoot and kill the, uh, the individuals. And sometimes, allegedly, uh, they did not actually turn and shoot. And in fact, sometimes they, we got sued and sometimes paid <laughs> a, a dear price for it. For it. But I just, I, I, I read this, this stuff about the mid uh, 19th century. And I said, well, this is obvious. I mean, not that obvious, but <laughs> because um, that you have a, you're in the frontier, you've got wars going on simultaneously with no justice system. You've got a sheriff and a marshal who, um, who are kind of, they got a living to make, and justice wasn't one of the things that was high on their list. <laughs> and, uh, and so things go haywire, and people take the law into their own hands. Uh, so that's one takeaway, and I'll give you the second takeaway, and then I'll leave it to Jim. Mm -hmm. um, so the takeaway of the first piece is even law enforcement uh, can sometimes feel like the justice system is not doing its job. And uh, even in the 20th century, in the late 20th century, they can take the law into their own hands and do what was, uh, you know, some would say, and certainly the lawyers who sued us would say, was an extra legal kind of activity. The second takeaway I had was uh, more recent, uh, and uh, and that was the issue of uh, of the jail, uh, the county jail situation, and uh, and again the issue of you know, how do you how, when the justice system fails, how do you restore public confidence to it? And just as you were just speaking in your lecture a moment ago, that the state finally came in, created a new district court, um, that it took the United States Justice Department to come in and restore not only constitutional policing in our jails, but equally as importantly to restore or begin the restoration process of public confidence in our jail system. Uh, because what was going on in the jails was horrific and uh, totally extra legal, no excuse for it, not even under the pretense of we're taking the law into our own hands because these are bad guys. They would beat the, excuse my French, the crap out of people uh, just because they looked at them the wrong way. And there was no, uh, for, for years, there was no justice system that came in and restore constitutional order. And uh, so I, I thought how fortunate we were to have a U.S. attorney in this town uh, who went all the way to the top and. Uh, 
and all the way to the top people have been convicted, sadly, uh, but rightly. Uh, and you know how this connects to the 19th century, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, but I, I think the common theme here is that that when when law when law and order, in the best sense of the word, when when justice breaks down. Number one, that's a, that's a prescription for trouble. When people lose confidence in the justice system, it's almost as though what choice do they have? And at least they can rationalize things, and it's not just in the, in the West. Uh, I would say that in Europe during World War II, people took the law into their own hands. Uh, and all over the world today, people are taking law into their own hands, in the Middle East and elsewhere. So I, I thank you for, uh, for your lecture, I thank you for your book. Uh, it, it, it's going to take a while for, for it to sink in with me as a former city and county official uh, <laughs> uh, to try to make the connection. Uh, and there, there is a connection. This is our DNA. This is our Southern California DNA. And so somehow this is, has un, an influence. Uh, whether, uh, whether I look like my great-great-great-great-grandfather or not, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> and whether this is related to what happened here in the mid-1800s, I don't know either. But uh, but there are lessons to be drawn, and it goes to Steve's History Matters business, which is so important to, uh, to try to learn lessons, even if they aren't directly connected to the DNA, to learn lessons, and not just from our own community, but to learn lessons of what happens historically when, when there is a meltdown in our, in our social fabric and what the consequences can be, and how we can mitigate that. And I cite this jail example again as a U.S. attorney coming in and putting a stop to this nonsense after far too long uh, and, uh, and, and restoring, or at least beginning the process of, of the re restoration of justice. So thank you. It's an honor to be on this panel with you. Likewise. Tim, no, let, let me respond. Oh, please, yeah, I'll, I'll be relatively brief. Sure. Um, I'm, uh, journalists talk less than politicians. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just kidding. Oh. But you write much med <laughs> more, <laughs> more words well, than we write it down, I'll hand it to you. I had uh, two takeaways, too. Uh, one, uh, the second really more in the form of a question. Uh, but uh, to, to the period that, that Zev was referring to, I, I first came to cover, I began covering LAPD in the early 90s, um, federal law enforcement and then LAPD, time of riots, Rodney King, et cetera. Um, roughly speaking, about 1,000 to 1,200 murders a year uh, in LA when I started covering it. Um, and I guess I would point to two kind of variants of vigilante justice in that period gang justice, where a real sense that police could not be trusted, police would not solve their crimes, with some justification, frankly. Um, so a lot of crossfire, uh, a lot of crips, a lot of bloods. Um, uh, and then the second piece, uh, which I've already referred to, which is the police themselves, um, who had in their own way, I think, lost faith in the justice system. They really did not feel that cases that they would be, that juries would treat their cases well, um, that cases would move too slowly. Uh, and so the, the police department that I first began to cover, I came in the very late days of Daryl Gates, um, the late and, and not dearly missed <laughs> Daryl Gates. Um, uh, and uh, the department was, um, was fairly wild. Uh, I mean, I, I met a lot of very good police officers, and I don't mean to, to suggest otherwise. But uh, just to give you one example, I've used this in columns and things that I've written later. Um, the police had a, uh, a system that was a sort of a pre-laptop uh, system for communicating from car to car. It was called the MDT system. And they would use shorthand to describe crimes and events. And the shorthand for a domestic disturbance involving an African-American couple was NHI, which meant no humans involved. Um, now, this is shorthand that they used in official police cars to communicate with one another. Um, it was common practice uh, in the police department in those years um, for police officers to beat anyone who fled. Um, in fact, uh, I think there's an argument to be made that the King uh, beating was actually less motivated by his race than by a department practice that was to enforce non-fleeing, which is dangerous for police officers, by beating people at the end of a pursuit. So there was a real quality of vigilante justice within the police department yeah. itself. Yeah. Uh, and which, I'm curious sort of how that fits into your kind of larger premise in the sense that it was a strong state institutional presence, it was just an out of control violent presence too. Um, which then leads me to my other uh, takeaway, and that's just the question. Um, I wondered, reading your book, which I also enjoyed very much, uh, and I'd recommend, um, it, I wondered if the conditions of LA weren't so aberrant uh, in that period as to make it difficult to extrapolate historical lessons mm -hmm. for the present. Um, 
only because the kinds of rates, for instance, that you were talking about in your lecture, they are so off the scale from what we're talking about now that I just wonder to what degree we can apply those kinds of lessons and to what degree they're just dated. Um, so anyway, those were my two takeaways. For you. Well, <clears throat> but yeah, but to, to that point in particular, you know, as I was uh, noting at the, at the top of my lecture, the kind of pattern we see in Los Angeles is longstanding. Uh, it, it uh, you know, we can document it back, uh, you know, four or 500 years in Europe. Uh, and we can uh, see the relationship between the rise of state-sponsored uh, justice systems with enforcement and with the enforcement, the judicial and the uh, penal parts of that system in place, we can see that rate drop as a result of the putting those systems into place. And uh, although it's not easy to see the direct connection, we can also, I mean, his, cultural historians have talked about, as I mentioned, the development of a more pacific uh, comportment mm -hmm. that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. That uh, The argument would be that uh, as uh, people begin to rely on the more abstract institutional form of justice rather than uh, uh, an eye for an eye, mm -hmm. their assumptions about human behavior themselves begin to change and they raise their children differently and, uh, and uh, through the generations you develop mm -hmm. a different kind of personality mm -hmm. that's less prone to violence, less angry, less incited, uh, you know, less violent altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, so in that sense, Los Angeles is not unique, and I think we can place it on a continuum with a lot of different societies. And I think as more people uh, do this kind of study, we'll find other places in the United States that you know, I'm not sure they'll beat Los Angeles. But they're closer to it. Yeah, yeah, that, right. yeah, yeah. so the pattern would be Interesting. similar. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there, I, I do think there are lessons to be learned mm -hmm. here uh, points to be made, and, and to sort of try to incorporate some of the other comments here, I'd also say that uh, one of the things that strikes me here is that, um, well, that uh, the point that I made at the end, that that's really a, an evidentiary finding, that the the authorities in Los Angeles, uh, although they uh, they complained and lamented the 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 levels of violence, they were never willing to, they, were, they, they walked the walk, they talked the talk, but they would never walk the walk. Hmm. You know, so like, you know, Hayes says, you know, we should, we should have a real police force, but we can't have a police force unless we pay for it. But they're not willing to pay for it. Uh, the, it's a, the, 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 inc the increasing efficiency of the justice system didn't, be, didn't come because people saw, well, we need a court to help with these criminal cases. They're backed up. And said, Wait a minute, what do we do about all these guys that want to develop property down here? We, you know, we, we, <laughs> need, we need a new court system. They were perfectly happy and eager to put in a new district court uh, for the civil, I mean, civil side <laughs> because it was impossible to do business. And uh, as a result, then we see the falling levels of violence <laughs> as an unintended consequence. Yes. <laughs> As an unintended consequence of that act. Is that because so, disputes were resolved that might otherwise have become violent disputes? Or? Well, there no, was a court it, system that could do it then. So, you know, this, this, this period I'm talking about dates to the, you know, the, 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 the monument we have in Los Angeles is the, is the Pico House. The Pico House was built in 1869, 1870. And at exactly the time when that new court system, and that was, the whole place was booming because of the, the, the ranchos were being broken up and they were being sold off as farm lots. And there's a lot of legal paperwork involved in that. And people were disputing that, and there were property lines that had to be drawn, and there were a lot of fighting over it. Now that could have resulted, and it did result in violence. But more importantly, they needed a system that could facilitate economic growth and development. And that was something people could, you know, authorities could understand that, and then they responded to it. They didn't respond to the violence. Uh, they, th those, although people, you know, the argument was there, people were, people were, were Judge Hayes, he's my example. He's putting forth arguments uh, 20 years before they happen uh, at what needs to be done. But it didn't get done. Why? I think Hayes is right. People judge property to be more important than life. Um, so is that something that we maintain? <laughs> you know, Los a yeah, th this, I don't, I'm not sure that people <laughs> will uh, like this comment, but I think actually Los Angeles historically has been under-policed. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, I think uh, a lot of people would agree with that. Yeah. It's, uh, <clears throat> and, and that the police have been deployed in, in the uh, inappropriate ways. Uh, there should be more investigative uh, policing and less monitoring, um, you know, less harassment and, and more determination of the, uh, you know, who committed crimes, getting them arrested and getting those cases, getting them convicted or the cases cleared, uh, making the justice system work, uh, understanding that that is the way to reduce the level of violence. Uh, and as I say, there were those who understood that, but they were always in the minority. The majority was convinced that, well, that we can handle this ourselves. Uh, not exactly understanding that that just simply set up a cycle of violence that perpetuated itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, so you, in that kind of a situation, you, you, a society needs something to break the logjam, something to intervene and break that logjam. And I think historically, in, the, in long term history, and in the case of Los Angeles, that intervention is the intervention of the state. The state, you know, the local government, state government, national government, the state needs to come in and you know, uh, ensure uh, a system of justice in the face of lethal violence. And, and the, the, the only other recourse there is is vigilantism. And that simply increases the level of violence. So, um, in some ways, it's a no-brainer, but you know, being a historian means being able to comprehend and understand and actually be a little sympathetic or empathetic, I'd say, with the, those perspectives of both sides. You know, uh, they, they thought they could pull it off or they couldn't pull it off. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you, um, flash forward, uh, this whole country, Los Angeles no exception, has gone through a profound increase in crime in the 60s and 70s. <laughs> So, uh, a very difficult period with crack and other things in the 80s, and then an extraordinary decline in crime. I, I mentioned 1,200 murders a year or so uh, in LA when I came here. Now, more like two. Um, I mean, the, the, the social benefit of that is almost hard to calculate. Uh, but that's taking place without some of the, it's taking place with a fairly consistent uh, judicial order uh, with police departments with a functioning state. So what if, if the, what you're describing explains some of the violent, the up and down of violence in very early LA, what do you, what, what describes or what explains those more current trends with yeah. crime? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, well, of course I haven't done any direct yeah, yeah. research on That's this. Right. I, 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 just, I just speak more of the, of the but in terms of thinking about the structures and the culture mm -hmm. of the violence that you do sure. address, in what Absolutely. way do they yeah. explain not just 19th century phenomena, but the most 20th recent and in the, the last, 21st, yeah. over the last 50 years? Well, uh, one of the first things to note about this is that that decline in homicide rates is a global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, it's happened all over. Uh, now, it's less perceptible in Europe and Canada and places like that because the rates were so low to begin with. Right, right. <clears throat> but if you look at the rates and you look at the, at the declines, they're similar uh, from one society to another. So, it's something about the trend in world affairs, or the, uh, it, it's, a, it's a global societal trend <coughs> over the course of the last generation or two. Uh, so it, there's been an enormous amount of speculation about that, and of course many uh, local authorities, a police chief in New York, uh, the mayor of New York, the mayor of Los Angeles, the police chief in Los Angeles, they all want to take credit. It's the same police chief too, by the way. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, it seems like something larger than that, than a you know a particular tech. I mean, and I certainly don't have the answer. I mean, criminologists are struggling to find an answer. To that. One of the things I would suggest is that the, if I'm right, and I, I don't, you don't have to rely on me. I think the criminolo criminology suggests that I'm right on this. That, uh, uh, as I said in the lecture, uh, domestic and intimate violence is the critical link in the social ecology of violence. That is, it is the place where it is reproduced and where, from where it bursts into the world, that people learn about violence in the home. Uh, I think we've been very successful <coughs> at beginning a campaign to really, if not eradicate, at least really uh, lower those levels of violence. And certainly, the, the soci our society today is so much more aware of it 
than when I was a child, you know, in the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, where were the, where were the shel shelters for battered women? Uh, where was the police intervention uh, in domestic disputes? Uh, what, the, 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 whole, the attitude of the justice system has been transformed. And I think if intimate domestic violence is uh, uh, responsible for the reproduction of violence, then a decline uh, in the uh, rates of domestic violence might have the effect of lowering violence in mm -hmm. general. I don't and, and, by and by extension, then, that's a, even further where efforts should be directed. Yes, so absolutely. If you further reduce domestic violence, you would um, erode the culture of violence, and that would have an impact on the larger structures that's of right. violence mm -hmm. that's and, right. the, and the rates. That's a speculation. I don't know of any. I don't know that there is a way you could construct a study that would actually test for that. Um, but, uh, but as a public policy prescription, yes. mm -hmm. it sort of is what yes. your study suggests. Yes, very much so. And there certainly is a lot of evidence that, that children who are victims of violence go on to be perpetrators. Well, there's no question violence. about that. Um, there's no so question about that. An intercession there at some level presumably would have the, the kind of effect you're Exactly. Mm -hmm. And yet, to go back to the 19th century example, you can't point to that much of a decline in domestic violence in the 19th century. No. Sort of explain. No, so it's a mul there, there are multiple factors sure. at work here. Uh, you know, and my argument about the decline in violence in the uh, late 60s and 70s, and then a continuing decline till the end of the 19th century. So uh, Los Angeles, by the end of the 19th century, the rates are hovering around 50 or something. And we move into the, 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 the 20th century. And Los Angeles has always had very high rates. Uh, and for the whole of the 20th century, higher than other comparable cities, higher than New York, higher than Chicago. Uh, uh, but th 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 that, that decline, I, I would argue, is largely because of the growing effectiveness of the justice system and people's reliance on the justice system uh, more than they had before. So I think that accounts for that drop. It's still, of course, very high. Mm -hmm. uh, and so th there are multiple factors at work. This, the one I'm describing in the lecture is only one of them. Uh, well, I'm describing two. One would be the domestic violence, which I think doesn't, that, that doesn't decline at all in my period. And it's not until the late 20th century we see, begin to see those figures Now, down. one thing you haven't, nobody sort of touched on this. I mean, you brought it up a little bit in your lecture when you talked about just the abundance of weaponry that the American population in, in, in particular brings with it and the industrialization of, of, of of, of guns that make it that much cheaper and more available. And I wonder, you know, in that sense, because we do have other studies of Western places, some of the most, you know, the places that are, were seen as the most violent places in the West. In fact, at least Robert Dykstra's argument turned out not to be. Some of the cow towns in Kansas in the 1870s where they do restrict the carrying of firearms. And you talk a little bit in your lecture about how no one's willing to go there. But I wonder, not to enter into even more dangerous <laughs> public policy territory, what argument your study suggests about uh, some degree of exercising restrictions and controls on, in particular, firearms. Mm -hmm. You know, in other places, people might fight, people might bite, people <laughs> might, you know, gouge eyes and ears <laughs> or stab one another, but they don't, if they can't shoot one another, they don't kill one another quite at the same rate. Well, that's true, very <laughs> true. Now, firearms are a very effective method of legal, lethal violence, yeah, there's no doubt about it. And, uh, you can commit murder from a distance. It's, it's quite different. And as I say, you know, as you see the rates go up in the 1850s and the 1860s, and simultaneously you see the, the rate of gun violence going up at the same time. Uh, and it's absolutely true, as you mentioned, that there are places, you know, Dodge City is an infamous case, Ellsworth, Kansas. Uh, you know, so, you know as, as you mentioned before in your setup, um, you know, Hollywood has you know, made these into the, you know, these violent places. When in fact, you know, <laughs> the rate of violence was relatively low, and the control of firearms was relatively high. Uh, and even in Los Angeles, we've got you know uh, Hayes is my uh, representative here, but there were a number of uh, prominent people in Los Angeles who consistently advocated uh, banning the carriage of firearms, banning the uh, the open display of firearms, banning the discharge of firearms within the city limits. Uh, back in the, the early 1850s. And this was 20, 20, 25 years before they put the restrictions on in the classic cow towns of the 1870s. So in a way, Los Angeles is ahead of the game, but they refuse to do it. Mm -hmm. you know, 
and they refused to go there. Uh, I think largely because, as, as the council said, you know, if we, if we ban firearms, you know, we have to have a we have to have more cops. And we, we can't afford more cops. <laughs> you know, so we can't do that. Uh, we can't pass laws that we know we can't enforce. And, you know, at the same time, they were uh, Hayes. The same. He said, you know, the, uh, get rid of guns. He said, and and, and regulate the sale of alcohol. Uh, you know, put a put a limit on how late at night you can sell it. Uh, uh, you know, enact the blue law that you can't sell it on a Sunday. Uh, you know, uh, but Los Angeles was uh, the uh, the biggest producer of the, the Los Angeles County was the biggest producer of wine and brandy in the United States from the 1850s to the 1870s. Hmm. You know, long before they planted the first grape in the Napa County, Los Angeles had a, a wine industry here. And their major customers were working people in Los Angeles. They would sold it, you know, by the gallon, and uh, that was that business was just too profitable. They they refused to put any limits on it at all. So firearms, and you know, you get you get reformers saying we got to re regulate firearms and we got to regulate alcohol. The two, they're saying these are the two major causes of violence in our in our city, <laughs> and the city fathers refused to regulate either of the two of them. So there you go. So I'm going to invite us to. Um, We'll continue the conversation, actually. It's um, out at the table where Johnny Farga will be signing books, and then upstairs at our reception that we have. I don't want to keep people away from a little food and drink. Um, invite anyone to offer any final thoughts before we move to the next stage of this conversation. Uh, if you were to go back into governance today, and you'd heard this lecture, <laughs> <laughs> and you had some control over laws to be passed and policies to be pursued? Well, I think uh, not to not to toot the horn of my generation of public officials, but both at the city and to some extent, uh, real extent, the Board of Supervisors, we, we did try uh, to apply certain public policies that we were discussing. Uh, ban on assault weapons in the city of LA means very, we did it, but it means very little. It would have meant a lot more in 1850s Los Angeles <laughs> than it does in 2016 because it's a big country and a lot of people now. Uh, but we did it anyway, more to, uh, as much as a, as a symbol uh, and as a statement, the same as, as we did in, in the uh, LA County Fairgrounds. For decades, the county used to uh, rent the fairgrounds to, uh, uh, to a gun show uh, and it was horrible, uh, not, not just because all kinds of illegal uh, weapons were sold, but, but because our, our imprimatur was on it. And, it was, and so we stopped it, we got sued, went all the way to the state Supreme Court, and they affirmed our decision. So I think we do, uh, there's a limit to what a, a local official can do in this regard. And, uh, uh, hang on, <laughs> probably my wife calling. <laughs> Where are you? Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, I, if if I were, I mean, honestly, I think uh, I think your book is so much more than just about the violence, uh, and I, I just want to point that out that it's it's a history of the beginning of this place, yeah, and uh, and and it's so important, in, in, as in many other cases, Steve. Uh, in teaching the history seminar I'm teaching now, there's so many books that we've read uh, in the class that uh, I said, I wish I had read them 40 years ago <laughs> because it would have been a much more interesting, in, in an already interesting career, it would have been a much more interesting career uh, to know, you know that at this corner in 1850, mm -hmm. they were hanging people is uh, <laughs> the kind of thing that I'm interested in. I'm a, I'm a little weird. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I, I think that uh, your book is, is a... Uh, it's obviously focused on the violence and justice in, in frontier Los Angeles, but it's also a history of Los Angeles yeah. Yeah. during this period. And it's you, really an origin story. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and the, you put it in context uh, so that we understand, you know, what else was going on, not only in, in town and around town, but around the country. Uh, so... Um, the one thing I'd say about that is that, you, you, you know, that it's... A number of people who describe the book, it's very downbeat, I got, a, I got a, a, an email from our friend Richard White, who's a historian at Stanford, who wrote, to congratulate me on writing such a dark book. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so that would be, we know that this is the way he thinks. Yeah. But, uh, in fact, what impressed me, as so much of our American history impresses me, is not so much the tragedy that's it's evident. Slavery and dispossession and uh, homicidal violence, these, these, are, these are evident in our past. What impresses me is that there were people there at the time who recognized it and protested it and said, this, this that, can't that go amazing. on. Mm -hmm. This would, must change. Now, they, they, they did not prevail, mm -hmm. but it's important to know that things just didn't happen, that they, there was always someone there to say, wait, this, this is not right. That we, we need to move in a different direction. I was amazed at the gun control, uh, the, the gun legislation suggestions in the middle of the 1800s. That, that blew my mind. There is one thing I would suggest as a public policy takeaway from all of this, uh, and that is that some of the, the services that, that uh, we can provide and that we do provide ought to be ratcheted up, mediation services. Mm. Courts aren't going to do it all. Courts are stressed out here right now, too. Uh, the, real, the real estate moguls don't even go to court. They get private judges to resolve their disputes. Uh, so there's an injustice in the way the, the justice system works now. But mediation services, intervention, uh, intervention with, with uh, families that have kids. Uh, we, know, we, know who the, we know who the families are that are the most vulnerable. We know who the families are that are most at risk for having a, a, a decomposition of the social fabric in their household, which may result in spousal abuse or child abuse. And so intervention in that regard is one of the things that comes out of your your conclusion is, is uh, getting, getting in between the barrel of the gun and yeah. the target and you know, being exactly. a referee and a counselor and all. I think that's something that uh, yeah. as much as it applied in 1870, it applies big time in 2016. Jim, do you want to say anything? Uh, I would agree with that uh, completely. Uh, and I guess the only other thing I would add uh, from my perspective, although it's a little bit uh, tangential to your to your book, although more central to our conversation, is that I just think it is a a national tragedy that this country cannot deal with firearms. Uh, that uh, you said is absolutely right. This is a very hard problem to control at a local level, but Congress's unwillingness and inability to do it, I think, is a ought to be a top tier uh, issue in this country, and it's it's catastrophic that it is. <clears throat> so I actually want to thank everyone for coming. Thank uh, John Farragher for uh, writing what I think, as we've all said, this is a monumental book. It's an origin story. It's not a happy origin story. <laughs> it's not clear whether it has a happy ending uh, to it. It's certainly one that sort of still lives with us. I, I do want to actually sort of say, and this is not in any way to diminish the um, research that you conducted to do it and the databases that you put together and then the vivid narrative that you constructed from those, uh, from those databases, but I also want to give a little shout out to the UCLA History Department here because in part, at least, it was Eric Monkinen, a longtime colleague of the UCLA History <laughs> Department, whose pioneering research into homicide around the nation and including in Los Angeles really set in motion the kind of study that you're able to do. Absolutely. So I, was, I relied on his research, on his database, uh, which was the foundation of what I did. Yes. Right. So, uh, so I think Eric Monkinen's uh, legacy really lives on in this book. And I thank you very much for the book and for the lecture. I thank Jim and Zev and all of you. And we'll, as I say, continue the conversation. The book signing in the lobby, the reception upstairs. Uh, buy your books. Please consider contributing to the UCLA History Department to continue the Eric Magnin legacy. And also thank you very much, Barbara Berg, for helping make this lecture possible.